G'day YouTube, this is part one of what will be a four part series recording the God Forbid radio program and we're talking about the end is nigh on God Forbid. Hello, I'm James Carlton. Welcome to God Forbid. This week it's the show to end all shows, you might say, because we're looking at millenarianism. The idea that the world as we know it is coming to an end and everything will be changed forever. Many Christians believe that day is coming. Some Muslims and Jews too. But there are also environmental millenarians who prophesize human extinction, also survivalist millenarians who prepare bomb shelters to survive everything from racial war to nuclear Armageddon. And with our expert God forbid panel, we're going to find out why. It's the end of the world as we know it. It's the end of the world now to our God forbid panel. Gary Tromp is emeritus professor in the history of ideas at the University of Sydney. He's written dozens of books and major papers. He's the world's leading expert on the religions of Melanesia, and he's the founder of the Institute for Millennial and Apocalyptic Studies. Gary Trump, welcome to God forbid. Thank you, James. So why are you interested in the idea the world is coming to an end? Well, that goes back a long way to childhood because uh, back then in the uh, 40s and 50s, people used to talk quite commonly about the possibility of the world ending. But talk to many people in the street, as it were, about their ideas about time and history. One is the optimistic view that everything's progressing. The other is a pessimistic one that everything's regressing. Then there's your evidence going around in circles. We don't really know where we're going. But the last one, which is like a, a pack, is the belief that the end is crucial for everything. And this is the idea that everything that happens in the world is a consummation, and everything really needs to be explained in terms of that consummation. Also with us on the God Forbid panel, the Reverend Dr. Robin Whittaker. She's a Uniting Church Reverend and coordinator of New Testament studies at Pilgrim Theological College. Her PhD is on the Book of Revelation, and she's writing her second book on the topic. Robin Whittaker, welcome back to God Forbid. Thank you, James. Good to be here. Why are you interested in the apocalypse? Well, I got interested in my teenage years, partly because I was part of a very conservative church group at the time who were reading it and telling me this predicts this is going to happen at this point and it didn't really make sense to me so that began a bit of a lifelong love affair with this biblical book and we'll have a look at that in detail later in the show but first gary trump what are millenarian ideas and how common are they oh they're always there working under the surface but bubbling up at crucial moments, usually a crisis. So from the Zoroastrian, Jewish, Christian and Muslim sources, we are living in a world which is looked after by the divine, and in the end everything will be resolved. These are comforting ideas, so that at the coming of the end of your own life, your end is gathered into the end. And are these ideas ubiquitous across geography? Well, even tribal peoples having a sense of things coming to an end. In Papua New Guinea, some people believe that everything will go down a plug hole in the end and disappear forever. What about Eastern religions, the Hindu faith? In Hindu thought, there is the yogas. You've probably heard of the Kali Yuga which is meant to be the bad and black time in which uh, we live. There are four big uh, yogas, and they repeat. And the first one is a time that's so heavenly, where the gods and the humans communicate with each other. This is called Kutu Yuga. And when the Kali Yuga is over, this will immediately return suddenly like an apocalypse, like a, a, a millennium that's so wonderful, so structurally, even though Indian thinking has these long eons in mind, and even longer in the Buddhist idea, 
it's possible to say the real idea is creeping in. And Robin, what are the Jewish prophecies in the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament? Well, I think there we see quite a difference. So the, the traditional Jewish prophetic texts, they do have a notion of a day of judgment, a day of reckoning, but it's often conceived of in real historical terms. And restoration within that scenario is about the people, the community being able to return to their land, rebuild their temple. So a very pragmatic in time events. It's with this shift, and particularly the influence of Zoroastrianism, that we see that day of judgment being deferred to some future time when time itself will end. So that's one of the big shifts, and it becomes this dualistic worldview of the future and the present, and God's rescuing action is placed outside of historical time. And Gary, Muslims believe prophets will return, but not Muhammad. Well, the director, Al Mahdi, is the equivalent of the messianic figure to fix things up. This is the Messiah in the conventional Jewish sense. And what you have with Islam is a recognition that Jesus is Mashiach in the Quran, the Messiah, but not taken as divine. How can you be the Messiah but not divine? Uh, well, <laughs> I mean, there were Jewish Christians in the early days of Christianity who only took Jesus to be human. And it's a word in the royal tradition. I mean, it simply means anointed one. So there is some question whether the Jewish texts that talk about the coming Messiah really envisaged a divine being or simply a divinely anointed being who would save the people. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, the thing is, though, they don't expect in the Islamic tradition Muhammad to come back. Muhammad is just a vehicle of the Quran. They do expect Almighty to usher in this final age and the Quran is all about finality, and tradition has it, not just in the Quran. There's going to be three crucial figures who have come at the end times. One is, in fact, Isa and Jesus. Remember that. That's shared between Christianity and Islam. The other is Moses. And believe it or not, the other one is like a cosmic Mary. Mary, like as a cosmic figure. On our end, it's God forbid, we're with Professor Gary Kromf, Emeritus Professor in the History of Ideas at the University of Sydney, founder of the Institute for Millennial and Apocalyptic Studies, and the Reverend Dr. Robin Whittaker, Reverend with the Uniting Church, also coordinator of New Testament Studies at Pilgrim Theological College. Up next, Rapture, Revelation, and Rome. <laughs> The source text for most Christian thinking about the end of the world is the book of Revelation, also known as the Apocalypse of John. It's famous for its last days, visions of catastrophes, plagues, and war. But that's not necessarily the message of the book. Its author, John, probably wrote it in the year 95 CE, the time of the Roman Emperor Domitian. Barbara Rossing is a professor at the Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago, and she told RN's David Rutledge that John's message to the early churches wasn't just religious, but political as well. He told the early Christians to stand against Roman rule. John sees Roman rule and the whole Roman Empire as highly problematic. He's writing to these churches to exhort them to be faithful to Jesus Christ, in spite of pressures to comply with Roman culture and Roman political and economic domination. It's an interesting point because a lot of this literature that comes out of the early Christian period, many people assume that it comes out of persecution and the message is stand firm against these people who are oppressing you. But the sort of um, scenario you're outlining there is a, something more subtle, right? It's, it's more a scenario of cultural appropriation of, of the seduction, if you like, of the advantages of empire. Yes, exactly. John is speaking about people being seduced by the culture and by its wealth and all the appealing aspects of it. And he wants to warn of the dangers of being seduced by this way of life. When we read the accounts in Revelation of mass indiscriminate death where the innocent perish, this makes me think of terrible natural disasters like earthquakes and hurricanes and so on. And we talk about apocalyptic scenes and the aftermath of these kinds of disaster. Is there anything in Revelation that can help us to find meaning in these kinds of catastrophes? Well, let me say a couple things. First of all, Revelation does not predict any 
catastrophes. So when some fundamentalists say God causes earthquakes or floods, I completely disagree with that. Natural disasters are not caused by God as punishment. But additionally, I think we can say that the meeting of the word apocalypse is to pull back a curtain to help us see events more deeply. And I do think it's important for us to try to see then what's going on with some of the events of the world today. And here I would definitely draw a distinction between those that we cause and those that we don't cause. Some and an increasing number of the so-called natural disasters are actually human. And I think Revelation can help us see connections between our actions and what happens in the world in time to avert those um, consequences. I think we're called to change the course of our life. Are you talking there about things like deforestation and the kind of poverty that forces people to live in, in flimsy houses, you know, next to rivers that flood? This is how these natural disasters actually are related to structures of oppression. Is that the sort of thing that you're talking exactly. about? Exactly. Mm. There's a Chilean Roman Catholic scholar whose work I use, Pablo Richard, who says that much of what we call natural disaster are actually the consequences of poverty and, and certainly deforestation and climate change. Your Australian colleague Tim Flannery says in his wonderful book, The Weathermakers, we are now the weathermakers. So there is an element of a wake-up call, I think, in the apocalypse that can help us today. But we need to be very careful about that because nothing is predicted by revelation and God doesn't cause these disasters. Barbara Rossing, professor of the New Testament at the Lutheran School of Theology in Chicago. She's the author of The Rapture Exposed, which you were speaking with our in David Rutledge. And Robin Whitaker, Professor Rossing, says there's nothing predicted in the book of Revelation. Many Christians would disagree with that, wouldn't they? That's correct. I think the book of Revelation is often read particularly by more conservative Christians who apply a, a literal hermeneutic to much of the scripture as predicting future events. But I agree with Dr. Rossing. I, I think it's a complete misunderstanding of the nature of the literature, which is, I mean, this very word apocalypse, apocalypsis in Greek, is about unveiling or revealing something that was previously hidden and for the author of revelation one of the things that's hidden is the evil and the injustice of the roman empire that people are being seduced by they're being convinced by the rhetoric and propaganda of rome and the other thing that's unveiled is that god is aware of this and watching and reigning in heaven i find the phrase of john collins who's a professor at yale who has worked a lot on apocalyptic literature and he talks about an apocalyptic imagination, that this is how these authors made sense of the world and imagined possible outcomes, possible solutions. But an imagination is not a prediction, and I think we need to make that distinction. But tell me about the characters in the book of Revelation. You can see why people would take a different view of the book. We have the beast, the four horsemen, the bride of Jerusalem against the whore of Babylon. Yeah, there's these wonderful symbolic characters in Revelation. And some of them loom larger than they should. The four horsemen of the apocalypse that have been given life in literature and art ever since are part of a symbolic vision of judgment that rolls out in chapter six. So each of the horses has a different color, red for blood and slaughter, pale green for death, for example. They're not literal. We're not supposed to sit around thinking about, ooh, who's a horseman like this? Some scholars have referred to this almost as a kind of fantasy literature. These are not real creatures. The one that um, is most perhaps misinterpreted is this beast who has the number 666. Now, most scholars agree that this is a historical referent to the Emperor Nero, and that's because there's a, an ancient practice of gematria where letters of the alphabet get assigned a certain numerical value. So in English, it would be A is 1, B is 2, C is 3, and so on. And if you add up the letters of Caesar Nero, you get the number 666. And if you spell it in the alternate dominant spelling, you get the number 616, which is actually a really strong textual variant we get in the tradition. So there's huge consensus that the number of the beast here is Nero. Our author is wanting to say this emperor who might have been lauded for doing good things for Rome is actually evil in disguise. Why wouldn't John, the author, have simply said it simply like that and avoided millennia of confusion? 
<laughs> Good question. I think that might reflect some real fear about the political ramifications if you are openly writing critiques of the emperor. Tell me, Gary Cronk, about the rapture. This idea is not in the book of Revelation or the question of prophets. Okay, back immediately.